And so we'll get into our message. We're going to Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp but put it under a basket but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus starts that off by saying, you are the salt of the earth. Notice the first two words. You are. It doesn't say we might be. Or one day if you, you know, you kind of get things in order, you, 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 you could be. He says by us as believers in Jesus Christ, those of us who know him have been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. We are. You are the salt of the earth. Amen. Whoa. Now this is, the, this is the king from the kingdom. There's a king talking. You are the salt of the earth. Disciples are like salt because they're precious. In Jesus' day, salt was a valued, precious commodity. Roman soldiers sometimes was paid to salt, giving rise to the phrase, he's worth his salt. And so that's where that comes from. Disciples are like salt because they have a preserving influence. Salt was used to preserve meats and fish and to slow decay. They didn't have refrigerators in that day. So they'd have these clay pots and whatever. Then they would put a layer of salt, some meat, a layer of salt, and meat, and on and on and go. And the salt would pull the moisture out of the meat and dry it out, but it would preserve it for a while and be able to keep it a long time and slow down decay. Do you realize that that's what God wants his church to be? The, the vehicle that helps slow down the decay in the culture around us, and we need to lift up Jesus to those around us. And when we do the lifting, he'll do the calling, and it all comes out right. But we are the salt of the earth. How salty are we is the real question. Mankind, lying in ignorance and wickedness, were as a vast heap, ready to putrefy. It's quite a vision, isn't it? But Christ sent forth his disciples by their lives and teaching to season it. God used the disciples of the early church. It almost seems impossible as we look through this that they're probably sitting there listening to Jesus as he's telling them all this stuff, thinking, how are we going to transform the world? But they did. And you see, Christians should have a preserving influence on the culture. That's why it's important that we speak up. See, we have bought into a lie, and it's called separation of church and state. Well, you don't believe in separation of church and state? I do that the state should never be involved in the church. But the church should be involved in the government. The church should be involved in the culture and the society around. We are the influence. But because so many Christians have bought to that lie that we've got to stay out of that arena, the culture is going to hell in a handbasket, isn't it? Oh, that we would wake up and realize that God wants to use us to be a transforming agent in the world around us. Next slide, please. Disciples are like salt because they add flavor. Christians should be flavorful people. 
We have something to be excited about. We have something to be happy about. We, our lives have been changed by the good news of the gospel. But to me, too many Christians go around sucking like they've been sucking on pickles. I mean, it's just terrible. That's not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be sharing what he's done for us. And to be that flavorful, that flavor that salt can bring. Now, I do some, I normally bring a, a different bottle of water because the bottle thickness of the plastic is so much better than the other bottle. Because these are terrible. Okay? Dasani. I do like Dasani. You say, why are you doing that? Because did you realize, as I was getting ready for this message, did you realize that the first ingredient that's put in here is salt? Not enough that you can taste it. It was supposed to be flavorful, but I bet they put it in there so you, when you get done a little while later, you want some more. Mm -hmm. I'll take a drink on that note. <laughs> so, 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, But you be watchful in all things. Endure affliction to the work, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You say, but Pastor Ron, is, wasn't Timothy a preacher? Wasn't he a preacher? Yes, he was. But also I want to tell you that every one of us, every last one of us, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have been called into the ministry. Ministry belongs to his people. Ephesians 2.10 says this, talking about God, for, he, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Walk in what? Into the ministry that he's given us to do. God has called us. There's another word you could use for it, and the New King James uses workmanship. I'll, use, I'll inject a different word. For we are his masterpiece. Did you realize that God thinks of us and sees us as a masterpiece? Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Every one of us has a job to do. We need to be salty Christians. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12. Why did he give all those? And notice every one of those things, all of one of those gifts that that Christ gave were all ministry gifts. And he gave them for a reason. For the equipping of the saints. That's you guys. For the equipping of the saints. For the work of the ministry. See, we too many people got the idea that, oh, that's what the preacher's job is. That's what we pay the preacher for. No. No. God's word says that we, he gave us, you came to know Christ, and you are in a, a, a church that teaches the word of God, preaches the word of God, and wants to take the word of God and put it in you to the point that you can begin to pass that same ministry on to others. That's the whole point, isn't it? You say, well... You know, there's so much going on, so bad, I hear people say, oh, I just want to get raptured out of here. That's not good thinking. We're still here because there's people that doesn't know him yet, that should know him, that they're a part of the elect, and they, we have to share the gospel until they listen and hear, and they come home. That's the work that we do. And why else do we do it for? For the edifying of the body of Christ. But if the salt loses its flavor, it's good for nothing. Wow. That's important. Jesus says if we lose our saltiness, basically, 
teaching us that he will set us aside. Because we're now used in the work of the kingdom. It's good for nothing. We must keep it saltiness to be of any value. When it is no good as salt, it's trampled underfoot by men. The same way if Christians lose their flavor, they became good for nothing. That's the whole point. Salt and light is a distinction. Salt is needed because the world is rotting and decaying. Do you realize when we take the gospel message into circumstances and places where things are rotting and decaying and we stand up for the gospel, we take that salt there and we begin to proclaim that, you can slow that decay down. And I've seen the Lord Jesus in situations step into the circumstances and change the rotten person and change their life. Deliver them. Set them free. And I talk about those every once in a while. The things that God has done over the years of my ministry. I was telling somebody before service, they asked how long I've been preaching. I said, well, this is my 55th year is teaching and preaching the gospel. That's a long time. So I got a few stories to tell. But I won't do them tonight, I promise. But God wants to use you to be a vehicle to transform something that's in your world. See, there's people that you know and you're around and you see that's in you have in within your reach of influence that I'll never know. And the same thing, there's people in my influence and realm of life that you'll never know. But if we all do what we're supposed to do and share the gospel message and lift up Jesus Christ, he will use us to be an agent. And through us, we'll share his message and he'll change and transform their lives. What a powerful thing that is. Light is needed because the world is in darkness. But if our Christianity imitates the darkness, we have nothing to show the world. Oh, that we'd show and shine that light brightly. The quote from Spurgeon is the next slide. Poor world, poor world. It is dark and it gropes in midnight and cannot get light except... It receives it through us. You are the light of the world. If you burn dimly, dim is the world's light. And dense is its darkness. Charles Spurgeon. That's amazing stuff, isn't it? When Jesus said, you're the light of the world... Jesus gives the Christians both a great compliment and a great responsibility. When he says we are the light of the world because he claimed that title for himself as he walked this earth. And just like Pentecost, as he was getting ready to go back at Pentecost, when he went back home, he says, wait and tarry and that the Holy Spirit will come. And those believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now they have the same power source inside them that Jesus had. And Jesus conveys and tells us as he's going back to heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father. You are who? The church, his people, his body. You are the light of the world. That's quite a statement, isn't it? And quite a compliment. Oh, that we let that light shine. John 8, 12 says this. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, and the I am, I've emphasized am, as you can see, for a reason. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Could have capitalized the whole word life too. John 9, 5 
says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But as he left, that light transitioned from him to his followers, to us. So the light of the world means we are not only light receivers, we're also light givers, and we don't see it like that. But we are givers of light. But his light, oh, Lord Jesus, shine in and through us. And oh, Lord Jesus, may we open up our hearts and lives to you that we can be the vehicle for that light. That's powerful. See, we must have a greater concern than our, our only ourselves. See, Satan will get us all wrapped up in ourselves if we let him. huh? But we must have someone to shine to. That light shines for a reason. There's someone in your realm of influence that needs to know Jesus Christ. I want you to begin to pray, Lord, use me to be that light. And to do so lovingly. That's the good flavor, huh? huh. Lovingly. Jesus never challenged us to become salt and light. I said that at the beginning. I'll pick it up again here. He simply said that we are. So we are the light. We are the salt. We are either fulfilling or failing that given responsibility. It's one or the other. A city that is set on a hill, cannot be hidden. Such a city is prominent and cannot be hidden. And the reason why he, Jesus talked about that, I believe, you remember, this is Sermon on the Mount. This is all part of the Sermon on the Mount. It got done with the Beatitudes, and he started, the next conversation was salt and light. But he talks about a city on a hill. I believe that city was the city of Sophed. It said it has an Altitude of 2,789 feet above sea level. It's the highest city in Galilee and in Israel. So when they were sitting on that mount, whatever elevation they were, they could turn and look and see that magnificent city. And Jesus used that as part of his illustration. In the same way, Jesus wanted the people of his kingdom to live visible lives that attract attention to God's work in this life. And a city set on a hill like that, you can see it from wherever it was, is very noticeable. And so he's called us to be, we're like that city on a hill. It says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand. Leave it right here for a minute. I was thinking about this. They had little vessels of clay, little pots, or whatever you call them. Some of them are like pour pots. And they, you put the oil in it, and you put a wick in it, and it'd light that wick, and it'd give a little light. If you put it down low, it'd just light the space right here. You get it up higher on a lampstand, lifted it up higher, it would, it would let the light go a little farther. And in that illustration, because they didn't have electricity, they didn't have those, that, those things. So I'm thinking, what would Jesus say to us today? How would he describe us today and to make the point? The point was, you know, you got your light out, it's shining. Oh, well, I was, I, I was just going to cover it up for a little while, you know. So we put things in little boxes, don't we? And then all of a sudden, okay, I can take it out again. That was the point that Jesus was making. You either have the light or you don't. You're not supposed to hide it. Remember that as a child, you ever learned that old song, This Little Light of Mine? I'm going to let it shine. Yep. That's what we're supposed to do. So I thought, what would he say to us today? And I came up with something. I don't know if he would or not, but here's what I'm going to If you get nothing more out of this message, I want you to remember this. Do not, don't be a dimmer switch Christian. Do you know what a dimmer switch is? Oh, oh we're around the God's people. Put that up high. 
Uh, yeah, we have to shine. Oh, I'm going to work tomorrow. Well, it's okay that they know I'm a Christian, but I don't want to shine that much. Just put that down dimmer. And we move that switch up and down depending on our circumstances and where we are. Jesus does not want us to be a dimmer switch Christian. He wants that light to shine. The idea of a lampstand gives the sense that we are to be intentional about letting this light shine. Even as lamps are placed higher so their light can be more effective, we should look for ways to let our light shine in greater and broader ways. Lord, may we see how you want us to be, Lord. Teach us thy ways, O Lord. Let your light so shine before men. didn't say let your light shine. Let your light so shine before men. That's what he tells us. Because let that light shine as bright as you can. But that gets awkward sometimes, doesn't it? See, the purpose of light is to illuminate and to expose what is there. It reveals truths and exposes darkness. Next slide, please. The figure of salt and light reminds us that the life marked by the Beatitudes not to be lived in isolation. All that he's given us and blessed us and given us of the Beatitudes. And why does he say right in the very next thing, salt and light? Because that's what he wants us to develop into. He's done, given us all these things. Now we need to let his, and he calls us as you are salt and light. The figure of salt and light remind us that the life marked by the Beatitudes is not to be lived in isolation. We, we often assume that the inner qualities can only be developed in isolation. Then we don't like to talk about what's happening in here to other people. We like to keep that stuff to ourselves. We keep it isolated from the world. Jesus wants us to live them out before the world. Very powerful. So, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now notice, who's getting the glory? Not us, and we shouldn't try. It's not us to get the glory for. But he wants us to have our lives to be visible that the world and those around us see. Why? Because you might be in a situation, you'd be around someone and they, they, need, they need a Christian to be there for them. And all of a sudden, there you are. But if you've got the dimmer down low, they may never know that it's you. God wants to use us to touch into other people's lives. Jesus pointed to a breadth in the impact of the disciples that must have seemed ridiculous. They're on that mountain, a thousand, there's a thousand of them, and you're going to be the salt of the earth. You're going to change the world. And you're going to be the light. The light of the world. And some of them are probably sitting there thinking, how can we do that? Because Christ is in you. It might seem ridiculous. How could these humble Christians salt the earth or light the world? But they did. God used them in that first century movement and all the things that was happening. And it brought the Roman Empire down. You know, all the other empires were all, someone came over and took them over, and that's how, that's how they were taken over. The Greeks came and took over, and took over, you know, they, they was always through some kind of battle, someone lost. Did you realize that the Roman Empire never felt like that? 
They rotted internally. And the gospel message changed that government, changed the world. And they've went, well, I could go off onto a real tangent, but I'm not going to. Oh, that we would let him work through us like that. The three pictures in this text together are powerful, speaking in the effects of Jesus' disciples in the world. Salt. Remember, it's salt, light, and a city on a hill. Salt is the opposite of corruption, and it prevents corruption from getting worse. Oh, that the church would get involved in the world around us and the community around us. Light gives the gift of guidance so that those who have lost their way can find the path home. A city is the product of social order and government, and it's against chaos and disorder, even though we're seeing quite a satanic move in this country trying to bring us to chaos and disorder. If the God, if we stand up, the church becomes the church. The same way that that brought Rome down can bring those things to an end. We are salt. We are light. May we be up and about our master's business.